Ultimately, our welcome is rooted in Jesus Christ, who we've come to worship and who we've come to know. Let us pray for a moment. God, this morning as we turn to your word, may your truth and your grace be revealed to our minds and our hearts, empowering our hands to go forward and to do your work in this, your world, on behalf of your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, I wonder just how many bad sermons there are on mission that center on the Good Samaritan. Because I feel like it's likely a lot, that there are likely a lot of bad sermons. And by bad, I mean that they don't tell us anything that we don't already believe. They give in to something called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is when we listen to stories or accounts that confirm things that we already believe or do. This is one of the problems of fake news, right? It confirms things that we already believe. Whether those things are crazy or not doesn't make a difference. They're confirming those beliefs. If we were to actually encounter the truth, it would bring us up short. It would make us question what we believe or what we do. And it might even set us free. For many, the Good Samaritan boils down to a version of the golden rule, something many of us already believe. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you is a basic ethical stance we generally believe. So when we hear the story, we hear Jesus confirming our own goodness. But if there's some... If there's one thing we should take away from this account in the Gospel of Luke, it isn't that we're good. The story we call the Good Samaritan is framed by a good person getting told by Jesus that he might not be as good as he imagined. He's a scholar, someone who knew the scriptural law. He might even have titles like reverend and doctor. And he comes to Jesus and he asks an important question for all of us to consider. How can I inherit eternal life? Jesus knows that the scholar has a confirmed answer to that question. So he puts it back onto him. The scholar then connects to parts of the Old Testament by saying, loving God and loving neighbor. Jesus likely surprises him by agreeing with him. But then he challenges them, not just to believe, but to do. We do not inherit eternal life by believing the right thing, says Jesus, but by, by, by believing and doing the right thing. From the very beginning, this story is about eternal life. It's about how our beliefs and our actions relate to each other so that we can find God. The confirmation bias we normally have with this story focuses solely on our actions. It boils down to being nice. But Jesus is concerned with eternal life, with how what we believe and do plays out in our actions. And being nice will have little to do with it. Eternal life is tied up with flesh and blood, with everyday choices we make where we hear the story as one about how to be a good person, Jesus tells the story about how to be a faithful person. As many of you know, I've been a missionary in Malawi since 2017, and I currently serve in two different organizations there. One of them is Zamba Theological College, where I'm a lecturer, and I, uh, it, Zamba... ZTC offers a diploma and bachelor degrees. We train future ministers and other leaders. Uh, you would have seen a picture if you saw the slide of five of our female students in a, uh, a dorm or a hostel that um, the, the Women's Missionary Society, Society in Canada helped to fund to build. And so it's a safe place for some of our female students to come and to live and to be there. And then I also work with uh, Theological uh, Extension 
Theological Education by Extension Malawi, which is called TEAM, and we work at the grassroots level, and we train lay leaders most of the time, uh, both in the congregation and as elders and those sorts of things. So I write curriculum for villagers to read the Old Testament of the Gospels. I teach uh, college-level classes on all kinds of different things. I advise a doctoral student, and I help to build up the best theological library in, their, in Malawi. My work really is about faith. What good am I, though? People won't ask this to my face, but I know that they think it. After all, there are so many developmental needs in Malawi. There's a high infant mortality rate, a low gross domestic product per capita. There's high HIV AIDS infection rates, and there's low access to electricity. Shouldn't I be doing some good, some real tangible good there? My answer is twofold. First, the, the Presbyterian Church in Canada is part of doing something good in Malawi. Presbyterian World Service and Development uh, is the relief and development part of the PCC. And through PWSND and its partner organizations, such an alliance, there's an alliance of worldwide churches and there's NGOs here in Canada like the Canadian Food Grains Bank and, and PWSND gets funds from the government. The PCC is doing a lot of good in Malawi. So I don't have to do good in Malawi because my brothers and sisters in PWS and D are already doing it. But my other response is that doing good is not enough. Jesus doesn't say that we shouldn't worship God or that we shouldn't think about questions of eternal life or that we shouldn't study the Bible. After all, it's a whole conversation about how to interpret the Bible that starts the story in motion. When I help students preparing for ministry, and when I train lay leaders who then work in their congregations, when I teach the Old Testament and help others to read it faithfully, I may not be doing good, but I am equipping others to be faithful. Obviously, the Good Samaritan is called good for a reason. So my protest that being good is not enough needs to get a closer look. Even more, the Samaritan can't be good because of his, he's faithful. Because by definition, Samaritans aren't faithful. Samaritans were a group of people who were left behind when the Babylonians came and then took all the other people into exile. And so they have a, a variation of Judaism that 700 years later has changed so much that it's recognizable, but it's quite a bit different. They're viewed as heretics and wrong. And there's no feud like a family feud to make enemies. They were reviled. And therefore... He couldn't be good because of what he believed. Now, we've turned the word Samaritan into something good. And I think in the process, we've made the words priest and Levite into something bad. We draw the conclusion that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you do the right thing because the Samaritan who can't believe the right thing is the hero and the priest and the Levites who do believe the right thing, then become the villains. But I'm not sure that we should do that too quickly. The priest and the Levite have some pretty good reasons why they don't help the victim. Perhaps the victim was already dead and their help would have been useless. Perhaps the victim was being used as bait by the robbers. They would come and help him, but then the robbers would descend upon them. Maybe if they went and he was already dead and they touched him, they wouldn't be able to do their role as priests and Levites by going into the temple and by bringing worship on behalf of thousands of other people. I think that we can see that trying to stay alive and trying to be able to do your job are not bad reasons for not doing something. In fact, we might think that they're good and normal and rational reasons for not doing something. 
So when I go back to the story, I remember something that one of my colleagues, Dr. Volker Glissman at TEAM, emphasizes when we teach the Bible to low literacy uh, adults in villages. If something gets repeated, it's likely important. That is, if there are words that repeat in the Bible story, we should pay attention to them. And something gets repeated here. Both the priest and the Levite passed by on the other side. This is a story of movement from, from Jerusalem and Jer Jericho back and forth and from one side of the road to the other. The priest and the Levite cross the road away from the victim. Eugene Peterson in his translation or his version of the Bible, the message, captures nicely what the Samaritan's reaction is. He sees the victim and his heart goes out to him in Peterson's translation. So the priest and the Levite go to the other side of the road, but the Samaritan, his heart goes out to the victim. There's a difference of belief at work here, sure, but it's also resulting in a difference of place. One group believes the right thing and goes to the other side. The other doesn't believe the right thing and goes to the victim's side. The story that Jesus tells points to a fundamental truth. We cannot love God and love our neighbor separately. Jesus does not condone the Samaritan's belief, or more positively, he doesn't denigrate the priest and the Levites. What he says is that we cannot draw close to God without also drawing close to our fellow humans. It's not an either or of good versus the villain, either love of God or love of neighbor. It's both and. International Ministries, the part of the Presbyterian Church in Canada that sends me uh, to Malawi, believes that we can't do mission at a distance. We can't fully love God unless we cross those things that divide us, like culture, like place, and be with the other person. I and my family, we lived in Malawi until COVID-19 uh, restrictions forced us home. And we lived at a place called Canada House, which you own. Um, thank you for that nice house. It's a residence that the PCC built in the 1990s for mission staff who were stationed there. Uh, for instance, my colleague, Reverend Joel Sherbino, who um, he and his family have lived there. Joel ministers three quarters of his time at Paris, in Paris, Ontario, at Pres the Presbyterian Church there. And then the other quarter of his time is spent supporting and equipping and funding a, a lay ministry um, of, sorry, lay people going into prisons in Malawi to visit and to uh, pray with them. Um, and Joel and I actually cooperated on a project that brought my, the, the training from team that we do with elders in all kinds of contexts into the prison because there's actually a Presbyterian church in the, this prison that we go into that the PCC helped to build the sanctuary of in the middle of this prison. And so because some of these prisoners are there for 20, 30, 40 years, there's actually a church in the, in the prison. And Joel and I and team were able, and, the, and his volunteers were able to train those elders to be able to lead as Christians and lead other people, other prisoners, to grace and truth. And we can do this all, we do this from Canada. I'm in Barhaven and Joel is in Paris. And we go, and the plan will be for us to go back and forth once COVID restrictions are lifted. But we can do that because we have already lived there. We are, in the words of the Associate Secretary for International Ministries, Glynis Williams, living links between Malawi and Canada. We know the people. We've gone to their weddings, and we've gone to their funerals. We've preached 
in front of thousands and in the tiniest of little villages. We have hosted people in our homes and we've been likewise hosted. We've eaten the only chicken in a village under an acacia tree. We've got the dirt of Malawi on our feet no matter where we go. And to be honest, we've seen some pretty shocking sights. Poverty and deprivation that go far beyond what most experience here in Canada. Sickness and lack of resources that would shock most of us. For sure, we've seen lots of joy and delight and celebration and hope. These are our friends and they're, they're great. We love them. But we've also seen a lot of sorrow and despair and struggle. We've seen some needs that are impossible to fulfill. No amount of good is going to be able to meet all of the needs that we've seen. And here, for me, is the deep truth of the story that Jesus tells. It is in crossing the road to be with a dying man that the Samaritan draws closer to God. To be present and with the sick and the dying, the imprisoned and the destitute is to be present to God in a way that we cannot be if we do not cross the road. You saw some pictures of minibus drivers. Uh, public transportation in Malawi is not particularly well developed, except uh, these minibuses. They're slightly smaller than, um, than minivans. They come from Japan, and uh, they, they uh, arrive. They immediately get gutted. Everything gets taken out, and they weld new benches in so they can get 14, 16, maybe 20 people in this small little minivan. And uh, the mini, it's a, it's a cutthroat business. Like Uber's got nothing on these guys. And they, uh, they have a driver and then they have a conductor who leans out the window and he'll, he'll say, Majinga, Majinga, he'll tell you where he's going. And then he'll, like if you walk by one of these places, they'll cajole you, they'll pull you into their minivan, um, their minibus. It's not exactly something that I really enjoy, to be honest with you. <laughs> Actually, I didn't like them. And many Malawians don't like minibus drivers. They're a necessary evil. They are horrible drivers. Many of them don't have licenses. And the minivans themselves aren't particularly well kept. You know, I remember the principal at, at Zamba coming to, to Blantyre, so about an hour drive, and he was on a minibus and he says, well, we got here faster because the brakes didn't work. So everybody had to clear out to get here. My first week, being in Malawi. I wasn't actually supposed to be working. I was just supposed to be settling and calmly, but that's not how Malawi works. And so I was going to a place called Mulanje, which is a, has a mountain, but it also has a retreat center. It's kind of like Gracefield, and, um, and it's a mountain. It's the biggest mountain in, in Central Africa. Um, and um, I went, I was going, and there was a retreat of, of young adults and teenagers who were minister's kids, and they thought this would be great. He does youth ministry, he's got kids, he should come, and my, my friend and colleague, Dennis Muleli, was organizing it. But I didn't have a license, I didn't have a car, I didn't know how to get there, so the, the church organized a driver for me to, to get there. Fine, that's great. Uh, and the driver's name was uh, Mahania, and Mahania um, didn't speak a lot of English, uh, a lot of Chichewa, but, and I had no Chichewa, and he had little English, so it wasn't a very chatty ride, but it was good. It was my first week. Here I am going out there to do uh, something. We drive down, and I'm totally at his mercy because I have no idea where we are, what's going on, what to do. Get there, hang out with the youth people, and I come out and Dennis says, well, Mahania used to work in Mulanje, so he's gone down the mountain in the, in the truck and he'll come back and pick you up when it's time to go home. Okay, no problem. You have to remember that there are no street lights and, most, and lots of cars don't have lights that work. And there are thousands of pedestrians everywhere. And so driving at night is not a, an advisable activity because you might hit somebody or you yourself might get hit. So I was hoping that we'd get back before sundown. 
so that Mohenia didn't have to drive in the dark. So we go for our little hike, come back, no Mohenia. He's not there. No idea where he is. So they're, they're texting him on the phone, and uh, I'm getting a little bit stressed. And Dennis is like, oh, no problem. Don't worry, Abusa. Abusa means minister. So uh, they would always call me Abusa. Uh, Don't worry, Abusa. It's going to be okay. Don't worry. Finally, Mahinia comes back, and it's, it's really sunset. Like, it happens like that. And it's getting dark, and we're driving down this mountain. And I'm like, okay, well, luckily this guy knows what he's doing. And as we're driving along, the dashboard lights start to flicker. I'm like, oh, that's not such a good thing. Um, and I'm trying to think in my mind going, well, it's likely an alternator problem. Maybe it's not charging the battery. Maybe well, like, what's going on here? And I'm like, Mahinia, have you noticed this? Oh, yeah, no problem. No problem. There's never a problem in Malawi. I, I learn after this. Like, if you say this is a problem, it's never a problem. It's always something that you just have to, to deal with. We're going along, going along. And it's this narrow two-lane road. And there are really hundreds of people walking. And it's at night uh, along this road. And the dashboard starts to flicker a lot more. And then, boom, there's no electricity in the car, in the truck. It's this two-lane road. It's dark. There's hundreds of people around. And there's no, like, no hazard lights, nothing. And there's like these huge trucks which don't likely have brakes hurtling along in both directions. To say that I was not super happy is likely an understatement because I have no idea what to do because I can't communicate with anybody either because I don't speak Chichewa and they don't really speak English. We get out, uh, push the truck over to the side. There's no shoulder and there's hundreds of people there. Uh, and as they go by, they go, oh, Mzungu, which means white person. And, and I had my collar on. Abusa, Muzungu, Abusa, Muzungu. And they're laughing. And Mahenya gets out. He pops the hood and he's looking inside. And I have no idea if he knows how to fix it or whatever. And he's trying some things and stuff. And all of a sudden, this minibus was coming at us. And then, boom, turned around, pulled up behind us. And this guy, the, the, the conductor, comes running out. And says something really quickly in, in Chichewa to Mahinua. And Mahinua is very dubious about this. Because remember, it's a minibus driver. And then the minibus driver comes up and goes, Don't worry, Abusa. I will fix it. I, will, I, I know what to do. As if I'm in charge. As if I know anything about this. He goes back. He kicks all of the people out of his minibus. And then somehow he produces this like eight foot long bar, this like pipe. And he comes and for the next maybe hour, he and his two other guys are talking. They're under the truck. They're in, they, they're really standing up on the truck and they put this bar down into the engine block and they're prying something. And, and I'm like, at one point I say to, his name was Mike. I say, well, Mike, if you think you can do, do your magic, go for it. And he's like, Abusa, we do not believe in magic. You just need to pray because magic won't work in this situation. Only prayer will work in this situation. I'm like, all right, I know how to do that. So I'm praying over the truck and they're reaming on it. And all of a sudden the truck starts. And Mike accompanies us a little while. My first introduction to minibus drivers is Miracle Mike, working on the engine. And the important part I think about this in retrospect is I was the victim, right? I was the person. I'm not the one that's coming to save. The Samaritan is the one that came to save me. And to be honest, his motives weren't entirely likely pure. He wanted some money and he thought that the Muzungu could give it to him. And in fact, I did willingly, gladly, just get me out, get me home. But in that moment, that exchange, the aid that is offered, the back and forth, the clarification of miracle and magic, 
Mike and I saw each other in a new way. We heard each other. We encountered each other. He offered aid, and I received it. And in some ways, there was a delight that was present there. I really do think that in that moment, he crossed the road. And in that moment, somehow God was encountered. It's an encounter that wouldn't have happened if I wasn't there. Today, at your annual meeting, you're going to make some decisions, financial decisions at your AGM. And before you do that, I want to thank you uh, for your contributions to Presbyterian sharing. Um, thank you for being faithful and not just good. Thank you for giving to the work that uh, International Ministries does, uh, to the work that I do. Uh, Presbyterian sharing does more than just international ministries, but obviously I'm most thankful that you're giving to work that we're doing in places like Malawi. Thank you for creating living links like me, like Joel, with your brothers and sisters in Malawi. Thank you for letting me get stuck at the side of the road and to meet Miracle Mike, to encounter God. Thank you for your faithful giving and support. And I think the challenge for you, as it is for all of us, is how can you cross the road, both as individuals and as a congregation? How do you encounter others directly who are beaten and left for dead on the side of the road? Not to encounter them because you are the good Samaritan who can offer aid. That keeps the power with you. But encounter them as a brother or a sister in need. Encounter them so that you can encounter God. There is risk and there's vulnerability involved in this. But the good news is that God has already crossed the road to be with us. In Jesus Christ, we have a Savior who knows both the pain and the suffering of death and the hope and joy of resurrection. Sometimes, sometimes, that Jesus looks a lot like a good minibus driver. Amen.